Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity of talking to members of the NAN Philosophical and Literary Institute. I should apologise first of all for the fact that I was unable to join you at the Book and Arts Festival in September, particularly as you were sponsoring me to give a talk on that occasion, but I'm afraid that illness prevented me from making the journey north. Now, one of my greatest difficulties in talking to you about James Augustus Grant of Nairn and the Nile expedition of 1860 to 1863 is that I know, after having worked on the man for many years, is that I know he was an important and impressive man, far superior in all sorts of ways to the official leader John Hanning speak. I think I know that, you know that, but people in the wider world, certainly other parts of Scotland, do not really appreciate this at all. And so one object of producing my Hacklet Society edition, uh, entitled James Augustus Grant of Nairn and the Nile Expedition of 1860-1863, uh, was to provide a more rounded picture of Grant than is usually given, and of the kind of work he was engaged in. Uh, most people, I think, are inclined to go to sort of existing comments about him, and I can quote one from uh, perhaps, in many ways, the most useful <coughs> semi-popular book which has been written about these expeditions to East Africa in the <coughs> 1850s and 60s, and that is the book entitled The White Nile, written by Alan Moorhead. And he says that Grant was quite a good chap, but no more than a loyal and uncomplaining companion for Captain Speak. This, of course, is completely and utterly wrong, and in fact nonsense. I want to correct such views, because Grant, in fact, was better educated, a more discerning traveller than Speak, and altogether, I think, a more sensible and impressive man. Indeed, he was certainly, whatever else he was, a better scientist. I now move on to my second slide, which you'll see is headed great interest in the Nile source problem. And I think it is very important to realise that the Nile source problem had been, as it were, on the agenda of educated people in the classical and modern European world for 2,000 years or more. The great Greek historian Herodotus uh, was certainly interested in the question. But much of the speculation and interest centred around the uh, geographer and astronomer Ptolemy, who lived in Alexandria in the 2nd century AD, is roughly 150 AD, something of that order. Now, the reason for this interest was that people knew, of course, not least those in Alexandria, that uh, the Nile flooded every year. Uh, that these great waters came down from somewhere, but where did they actually come from? What was the source of the Nile? No one seemed to know, uh, though there were odd stories about it. One story, which I think is, again, complete nonsense, was that a Greek trader called Diogenes somehow or other got to some mountains, uh, usually called the Mountains of the Moon, which don't really exist at all, that Diogenes reached these mountains and found that the sources of the Nile ran from the, the two sources of the Nile. He reckoned there was a western one and an eastern 
one, the two sources of the Nile came down from the mountains of the moon to two lakes. Uh, and uh, these lakes then united and the stream, great stream of the Nile, flowed down to Egypt. And quite a lot of people believed this. And the story was uh, taken up again in the 19th century, uh, especially by the famous uh, geographer and savant Richard Francis Burton. And uh, he was inclined to believe that the western lake reservoir that Diogenes had mentioned was uh, a lake he had discovered on an expedition which the Royal Geographical Society had arranged for him in 1857. He got there in uh, 1859. Uh, and his companion on that occasion was Speak, when the two men uh, fell out uh, for various reasons, uh, one of which was that when Burton was ill, as they returned from Lake Tanganyika, uh, Speak had made a sudden journey northwards and reached the southern end of Lake Victoria. And he said, this must be the source of the Nile. And so there were great arguments between them. When they eventually got home, the Royal Geographical Society said, well, Speak, we must send you back again to establish your claim. Uh, Burton was very unhappy about this and continued to insist that his Lake Tanganyika was a source of the Nile, which incidentally it isn't, uh, while Speak said his Lake Victoria is the source of the Nile. And so they uh, quarrelled, but the Royal Geographical Society decided to send Speak back. And Speak himself chose Grant to be his companion. His, it was someone whom he had known in India because they were both members of the Indian Army, captains in the Indian Army. Uh, however, Speak imposed certain conditions on Grant, which I think in retrospect one can see as rather unfair and selfish. It was that all the materials which Grant gathered, his botanical notes and specimens, uh, his drawings, uh, generally his expertise should be put at Speak's disposal uh, uh, and used by Speak as he saw fit. And that had two important consequences. The first was that Speak used uh, a lot of Grant's scientific work in his own book. Uh, so, for example, there is a very impressive uh, appendix to Speak's book, which was called Journal of the Discovery of the Source of the Nile, um, published in 1863, a very impressive appendix of Grant's botanical specimens and uh, drawings. Even more important, uh, and it's worth noting this for what I say later, was that he insisted upon uh, having all the drawings that uh, Grant had made, Grant drawings and watercolours, 200 of them, at his own disposal. And it's worth saying immediately that he used th th these photographs in a way that it did not always reflect uh, their true nature. Grant was not a great artist, but he did try to uh, depict things truthfully. Many of the pictures were doctored by the engravers, the people employed by the publishers, and, uh, uh, and so a good many distortions uh, came to be made. And this was one important reason why when I produced my edition of Grant's own book, which he, with, with some irritation I think, which he uh, produced in 1864, the original book. He, he produced this book in, in order to um, put some things right. Unfortunately, the publishers did not allow him 
the space to put in any of his own pictures, which I think was a pretty awful thing to do. So let me now go on to uh, my next slide. I continue then by saying that the Walk Across Africa book by Grant was published again by Blackwoods uh, in 1864. Now my second edition, 1918, 2000, I pick upon 2018, is a much expanded version of that original 1864 book. And the reason I have much expanded it is partly indeed to do justice to Grant, partly because I wanted to include uh, many more maps and uh, the original illustration. So let's get towards the expedition itself. Um, the, as you'll see from the maps that I published later on, um, Grant's companion, his leader, John Hanning Speak, discovered the real source of the Nile in Lake Victoria in, on June 28, 1862. But it was Grant who produced the maps, as again I hope to show you uh, later on, which substantiated this discovery and a great uh, many other cultural and scientific pieces of information. you notice from the picture I include, which was taken from a, a photograph uh, made shortly after, or a photograph and engraving made shortly after Grant got home again, that in fact he had lost fingers and thumb of his right hand. Uh, it was an act, of, well, uh, an encounter <coughs> during the time of the so-called Indian Mutiny, um, whilst, whilst he was serving as an officer in the Indian Army. Despite that, you can see that he was quite uh, a, a handsome youngish man still. So I now move on to my next picture. And I find that I really must pause, as it were, to tell you something about the uh, Hackford Society, because uh, my edition was produced for the Hackford Society. And you see here uh, pictures of my e e edition uh, with another photograph of Grant as its frontispiece and the outside of it with the logo of the Hacklet Society, which is uh, a ship, Victoria. They're rather handsome volumes, but I want you to notice that uh, logo in particular uh, as, I, as I go on to the next slide. So, Hacklet? Why Hacklet? Well, Richard Hacklet was a priest and scholar. He thought that Britain was falling, or rather England at that time, uh, he thought that England was falling behind uh, France and Portugal and especially Spain in overseas enterprises. And so he tried to produce a series of studies or and extracts from uh, the work of English navigators and explorers to kindle interest in the, the um, Elizabethan period. And he did this principally by uh, producing this collection of extracts from their work called Principal Navigations and Voyages of Discovery of the English Nation made by sea or over land. Um, and the Hacklet Society was actually founded in 1846 and after some argument they decided to call it the uh, Hacklet Society and to concentrate on English enterprises. As I move to my next slide uh, which uh, tells us uh, a wee bit more about the Hacklet Society. The real founder, the man who had the wit and interest to 
say we really ought to set up a society which will study the records of the travels and navigations of the English people and uh, many other peoples because the Royal Geographical Society which had been founded a few years before in 1830 wasn't according to this man Cooley doing its job properly and he wanted a society which would um, look at these old or perhaps not so old voyages and travels uh, to see what could be uh, discovered from studies of them since the Royal Geographical Society did not seem in 1846 to be doing very much practical or intellectual according to Cooley but he did think that the coverage should be international and not just British well he was overruled but nevertheless he got round the problem in a rather interesting way the logo which he chose for the society was in fact a ship as you'll see there called the Victoria and that's the image that has appeared on the cover of every one of the 300 or so uh, Hackler Society volumes published since 1846 but the, the logo is the Spanish ship Magellan's ship on which, as you will know, he aimed to sail round the world. And uh, here are a couple of images of this Spanish ship, Magellan's ship. In fact, he did get round the world, as you probably know, he was killed in the Philippines. Uh, uh, but his uh, second in command took the boat on back to Spain and so completed the first known circumnavigation of the world. Well, Cooley was very impressed by this and wanted to keep this Spanish ship as the logo of the Hackler Society and he succeeded uh, and there it is you see. And there, there, I've included there a rather nice depiction uh, of it, uh, a less good one uh, below um, but you see also a picture of Magellan and uh, Sebastian Del Cano I think uh, there. So that has uh, kept the Spanish influence on the Hackler Society ever since. Now, after that digression then on the Hackler Society, let me move back to the question of discoveries and in particular the Grant uh, and Speak expedition of 1860-63. to First of all, on this map, uh, uh, as depicted by a, a geographer called James Rennell in 1824, you'll see first of all the mountains of the moon, which don't really exist, and, and they're, they're shown running east-west, whereas all the relief, drainage, uh, and rifting, and so on, in that part of Africa is north-south. Anyway, there are, he's still, after 2,000 years, including <laughs> the completely legendary mountains of the moon. But what I perhaps really wish you to note on this map is the fact that the sort of northern and western Africa, by 1824, were reasonably well known and the places and rivers and so on uh, could be put on the map. There was still uncertainty about the termination of the Niger, but you know, in general, uh, things were known. Uh, the same is true, as you see, of sort of southern and southeastern Africa. But the great thing is the gap, the blank space, just south of the mountains of the moon. And that blank space was really created by learned French geographers of the 18th century, especially a man called Delisle and another one called uh, Donville. And they looked at all this stuff about Ptolemy and Diogenes and whoever and said, it's all nonsense, we just do not know. And so they show a blank space. So that is a great challenge for everyone. As I move on 
to my next slide, which shows that one of the things they got rid of. There is a sort of classic version of this Mountains of the Moon with two lakes idea. And a great many people, both in the 19th century, and I'm sorry to say, a great many people, even in the 21st century, believe that that has some relation to reality, that those two lakes do in fact uh, represent lakes that exist. Uh, and that, that is not true. Um, and so there is Ortelius's his map with the with the two two lakes, and really some quite respectable people believe all this uh, uh, nonsense. I'm afraid, and I shall now move on to my next slide, which shows East Africa's lakes as they really are. And if there are two lakes uh, which correspond to uh, that map I showed you previously by Ortelius, I suppose you would have to say that the uh, two lakes are Lake Victoria, there shown on my modern map, and Lake Albert. And there are two, there are people still, uh, I, I'm sorry to say, who believe that Lake Albert and Lake Victoria are the two lakes in effect shown on uh, Ortelius's map. And whilst we look at that map, it is worth noting that you can see the course of the Nile from the northern coast of Lake Victoria, uh, flowing southwards to Lake Chioga, then doing a great bend uh, by the Karuma Falls, uh, and then into and immediately out of Lake Victoria. And one puzzle you may have is that the point where the Nile flows out of uh, the lake, or out of Lake Victoria, is named Ripon Falls. Now Speak uh, decided to name the falls after the Earl of Ripon, who was the uh, president of the Royal Geographical Society when the expedition set out. Incidentally, uh, the, the falls in any case have now been submerged because there is a hydroelectric scheme uh, a little further downstream which uh, made the level of Lake Victoria go up. And so there, there is the, uh, our East Africa's lakes as they actually are. And I go on again to my next slide. And I show here the route taken by the expedition, uh, more or less accurately. Uh, and uh, you, you'll see that the expedition started from the coast where you note Zanzibar and then uh, on the coast opposite there is a place which isn't actually named on that particular map uh, Bagamoyo and the expedition actually began to go inland from uh, Bagamoyo through various areas uh, inhabited by people quite unknown to European science before, with landscapes and uh, resources and so on, as I say, quite unknown to European people. And they moved inland, and the most important place they reached immediately was an area you can just see marked as Tabora, uh, which is in the centre of the country inhabited by people called the Nyamwezi. And then they moved northwards uh, along the western side of Lake Victoria until they reached the great kingdom of Buganda and from there were to go down the Nile, as I'll show you. Both Speak and Grant were gathering information about the countries and peoples they encountered, but I think that Grant's information is in many ways better than speaks, uh, and moreover, as I said before, uh, he was all the time making the sketches and watercolours, which were the first ever visual record of a colossal area of land in Africa.
Now, I, I shall move on again to say more about that information gathering, if I can move on to my next. Now, here is Grant's journal. This is the book in which he recorded his impressions and ideas. Uh, and I've chosen one of the better chip pages of it. Perhaps I should have uh, chosen one that's perhaps more typical. But as you can see, I think that Grant was frightened that he might run out of paper. So he wrote in an incredibly small hand, which is very difficult to read, even if you have a, a magnifying glass. Uh, and I've read a great deal of this journal. Um, but found that it is so detailed, so difficult to transcribe, that I couldn't make a book just of the journal. It, I, even if it were transcribed accurately, it would be unreadable because it's so detailed. Nevertheless, I have taken a considerable number of extracts from that journal to enhance certain points in my in my edition of Grant's book, um, uh, as I think uh, you, you, you will find. And one of the things I've done in the course of the book on these pages, as you will see, is to incorporate uh, page references to the, uh, the book and, uh, uh, and journal. As I move on to yet another slide, Grant was probably best at photographing things uh, but uh, and indeed this is more about his pictures and indeed he he, he did uh, take a number of photographs in the um, coastal area and in Bagamoyo I think now the photograph I show here is of the uh, slave market in Zanzibar. Pretty awful place as you can see. Uh, man on the left is an Arab slave owner. The women you can just see lying on the right are slaves who are probably about to be carried off in a boat to Arabia or one of the Gulf, Gulf states. Um, so these photographs that Grant actually took are really quite interesting but he found that it was impossible for him to go on taking photographs because he was using the wet colloidian method which was the method in those days and you had to um, go into the dark tent to develop the images and Grant found that in the tropical heat it was just too much for him Moreover, the equipment to be carried was heavy and awkward to manage. So he decided to give up photography and revert to his drawings. But there the, the was one or two uh, photographs that he did take are extremely interesting. As you see from this one, then the slave market with an owner and the slaves. And I'll go on to my next slide. Uh, that leads me to say that when uh, Grant was making uh, sketches, he found it very difficult to uh, depict people. Uh, here is an example. On the left, you see two examples of his trying to depict the king, or Kabaka as he was called, of Mutesa, the mighty Mutesa, ruler of Buganda, the most important ruler of that part of Africa, uh, uh, who, who, who ruled over indeed the uh, area where the Nile source was located. And you can see what happened. This is not perhaps a bad example, but uh, there, on the left you see two examples of Grant's drawings and what people called the Kabaka's Palace, uh, this great thatched reception house it was really, and what the engraver in London 
made of it. Well, it's not, that's not too bad, perhaps. Uh, so Grant's attempts on the left and uh, the engraver's version on the right. For reasons we'll come on to, Grant was to be very upset by certain of the uh, engraver's images that were created. And I'll move on again to my next. I think it's important, before we go on very far, to uh, show one of the most successful of Grant's f f uh, photographs. We managed to get the man to stand still, and this is the man called Bombay, who was in effect, well not in effect, he was really the leader of the porters, the 200 or so porters that were engaged to take the expedition and its trade goods to uh, to Buganda, to the Niles or Sarah. You had to have trade goods to pay your way along the route. Um, and I've also included on the right uh, Grant's attempted depiction of what the, what people called the caravan, what the expedition looked like as it moved along. And you see that in some cases two men are carrying the heavier loads uh, and uh, in some cases it's just one man. One man was reckoned to be able to carry about 70 pounds. But Grant uh, and Speak found that Bombay was an absolutely vital man because uh, not only did he lead the porters, uh, though he had rivals among other Africans in the party, not only did he lead the porters, but he did much of the negotiation with African leaders whom they encountered. Um, as I say, they acted as a translator and negotiator. So again, I'll move on, if I may, to the next thing. And I think the point to make here is that although Grant was reasonably good uh, at drawing things like specimens of birds and trees and plants and so on, he really found it very difficult to depict people. Uh, and I, I said that that was true of Mutesa. It was true also of a great many of the people he encountered along the way. So at one point he was trying to have just outlines of people's heads, as you see on the left. On other occasions uh, he attempted to sort of fill in the drawings as though to uh, produce silhouettes. And uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the man on the right with the staff uh, is, uh, is quite an important man, uh, a sultan of a particular uh, area whom he encountered. So there, there are his uh, attempts to depict people as I move on yet further. Uh, and here you see Grant is much, much happier because he's depicting uh, plant life uh, and birds, uh, dead specimens. And as you can see, drawings are very accurate. Um, and th this slide also indicates Grant's principal, but not only, scientific interests, botany and ornithology, which he had studied at Marshall College in Aberdeen, Marshall College, which was an independent college um, for many years and then uh, was uh, forced by government to join up with the University of Aberdeen in 1860. But anyway, coming back to the pictures themselves, uh, plant life, that is a uh, rather attractive plant he discovered, Spathodia, uh, and I've included in uh, the middle of the slide the version of it which appeared in a very major publication that Grant decided to make rather later in his life. He got fed up with the idea that all his material had been taken by Speak and used in Speak's book, 
why shouldn't he publish his own uh, account of the science of the expedition? And so one of the things he did was produce uh, the, uh, some volumes of published by the Linnaean Society, uh, and uh, there is one of the engravings, of course, made by a professional plant uh, artist of this uh, same Spathodia uh, in various stages of its growth. It's a very impressive collection, um, and a collection that is still important if you want to understand East African uh, plant life. On the right, again, static images of various kinds of um, uh, bustards, I think they are, uh, which is illustrating in such a way as to indicate the most important features of their plumage. So Grant was a considerable scientist, especially as far as um, the uh, study of plants and birds was concerned. And again, I, I move on. The explorers now reached the town which you'll see marked on all maps as Tabora, a name given, I think, by Arab interluders into the interior. But it was, in fact, the most important of the chiefdoms established among the Nyamwezi people. And many of these people had begun to take ivory down to the coast to sell. Yet the Arabs from Zanzibar were beginning to supplant them by coming inland themselves. Musa Muzuri, though actually an Indian, was perhaps the first to come. Hence his headquarters where the explorers stayed. He was a very hospitable man who had lived in Tabor for some time, but his relationship with the local Africans was not very good, nor was that of any of his Arab companions, and uh, Speak and Grant were forced to avoid becoming embroiled in any of the contests that went on. I now move on to the next side, which you will see consists of a picture of a gang of slaves. Grant depicted this picture uh, because he was so shocked and disappointed to see slaves and he assumed that they were slaves belonging to Arabs and that the habit of slavery had been imported from the coast. So he saw uh, something that was inimical and unwanted being brought into the interior by the Arabs. Possibly, however, these slaves were traditional uh, slaves, or slaves found in traditional societies, but I do think that the chains suggest that Grant was right, and that this was a coastal influence. And so this was another reason for Grant thinking that something must be do done to redeem these people. Let me move on to the next slide, as you'll see. Grant's two depictions of economic activity in Unyamwezi, uh, un, the U in Unyamwezi denoting the people, uh, the place rather, of the people, the Nyamwezi. And these illustrations by Grant are one excellent example of his meticulous information gathering and scholarship. Each part of the harvest was carefully noted and uh, described, and each tool or other object carefully identified. And so here was absolutely vital information of the kind that the ethnographers of the time really expected a scientific explorer to gather. And you, a close inspection of these depictions by Grant shows that uh, he gave the local name and a meticulous description of, of the use of each tool. So I think that's a very good example of Grant's work. <laughs>
<coughs> However, as the explorers moved northwards, uh, they left the territories of the Nyamwezi and came to a country which is perhaps to be regarded as the first of the so-called interlocustrine kingdoms or chiefdoms uh, around uh, the Great Lakes of East Africa. They were in Karagwe and Grant was fascinated by the place. He particularly liked the lake here in, in Karagwe, uh, which he thought was rather like the Lake District in England. Indeed, he dubbed it Little Lake Windermere. Uh, because it reminded him so much of the English Lake District. Equally, he found Rumanica, who was the ruler of Caragüe and his people, attractive and uh, interesting. Their function, I suppose, in Caragüe was to work, as it were, as gatekeepers for the powerful kingdom of Buganda to the north. Um, indeed, I think Rumanica was in practice under the thumb of Mutesa, the great ruler of Buganda. But something uh, occurred in this region uh, which I now want to bring to your attention by moving to the next slide. Uh, a little earlier than they reached Caragüe, Grant recorded a picture of a dance. Uh, let me show you on the left the dance going on as he recorded it. A rather wild scene, if you like. Um, but then, to the right, you'll see the version of this picture altered by the engraver. Uh, by the engraver, although possibly in this case, I suspect, at the orders of Grant, and he has asked for Grant to be put into the photograph dressed, if you like, as a comic book Scotsman in tartan trues and uh, deerstalker hat and so on. Uh, Grant certainly did not like the joke and it may have contributed to his growing upset that this altered picture should be shown in Speak's book. And you'll notice not only is, Speak, uh, is Grant rather dressed as a comic book Scotsman, but he's dancing with a bare-breasted female. In fact, at the original dance, if he took part at all, or if anyone else took part to his notable, it was Chief Ukulima, whose little picture you see on the right, as depicted by Grant. He was old and definitely male. So there are two reasons uh, there, I think, why Grant was so upset by this picture. But I move on further north with Grant by coming to my next side. Hearing from Speak, who had already reached Uganda, that uh, his companion uh, Grant was still further south in Karakwe, the king decided that Grant must come to him, and so he sent a party of men to fetch him. Now why was it that Grant was delayed in uh, Karakwe so long, and why was it but when he was taken north, he had to be carried in a litter. Well, the answer is that he had suffered a badly ulcerated leg, which made it impossible for him to walk for several weeks. In his own book, he rather concealed the extent of his suffering, but in my revised version of his book, I have included extracts from his journal which indicate that uh, he really was in, in a very bad way. He, he tried such remedies as he himself had which didn't amount to very much 
Uh, he tried various African remedies which were suggested to him, but it was quite clear that only time was going to heal the affliction. So he was still laid up uh, when the party from Buganda arrived, and so he had to be carried in this litter, which you see in my picture. It was very uncomfortable. He <laughs> hoped to be carried the other way round so he could see where he was going. Um, but as he gradually got better, uh, he was glad to be able to get out and walk for short distances when he could. And one of those occasions came uh, when, as you see in the next slide, they reached a point where Grant obtained his first view of Lake Victoria. They'd been walking around the south of the lake and around the western side of the lake and had not actually seen it. Um, uh, here it was, and um, here Grant, uh, a, a, a tremendous little picture. Now one scholarly commentator has described this as Grant demonstrating that he was monarch of all he surveyed. This is nonsense, it's far from the truth. Grant was recording the scene at a time when he was completely at the mercy of the peoples with whom he was living or travelling. He was certainly not monarch of all he surveyed. And what he did here was to show the lake and then just to intrigue his companions, he said, well, I'll put in some steamboats, because this is what may happen in the future, uh, that uh, we'll begin to develop this part of the world, and steamboats will sail on Lake Victoria. And that, of course, is exactly what did happen. Uh, and steamboats did, and still do, sail on Lake Victoria. And at this point, I'll move on to the next slide. Uh, finally, Grant did get carried to Uganda and reached Mutesa, the mighty king of Uganda, and began to know something about him. Um, he was intrigued, as everyone was, by Mutesa, this young and powerful, unpredictable man who ruled uh, the kingdom. Grant, in fact, made many attempts to draw Mutesa, and here he shows his reception building or palace. Whether that was really a good likeness, or, or, or whether the two pictures really constitute a good likeness, I, I do not know. I'm not aware of anyone actually having uh, succeeded in painting or, or, or taking a photograph of Mutesa. But of course Grant continued his investigations and observations. Just as he had done in Unyanyembe, you'll recall, Grant tried to recall all the details he could about daily life in Buganda. And here he identifies various musical instruments which were in use in uh, Buganda. Grant, as it happens, was extremely interested in music and I think he'd taken some music lessons uh, whilst he was in India as an Indian Army officer. But he, he identifies and names all these uh, instruments and that drum in particular was copied by various artists uh, and used elsewhere as an example of what they assumed was a typical African drum. But perhaps more important uh, were the weapons and implements that you see on the right of this side, uh, rather as he had done in the case of those Unyanyembe uh, implements and harvest and so on. He carefully named and identified each object. And a little picture down at the bottom of that slide is quite interesting because it was the one image that was allowed to appear uh, as, as an embossment on the cover of Grant's book of 1864. But because the main thing is that this is another example 
of Grant's meticulous and careful investigations. I'll move on to the second side, uh, the next side rather, to emphasize the point that uh, the constitution, if one could call it that, of Buganda was extremely <laughs> difficult for anyone to understand. Um, but the mother of the current Kabaka uh, had a considerable amount of power uh, in Buganda, uh, and indeed that power was extended to the clan, a particular group of uh, ethnically uh, similar kin, kin group uh, that from which she came. Once she, were, if, if she was the woman who had produced the Kabaka, that clan obviously had great advantages. And perhaps without entirely realizing what they were doing, Grant and Speak realized that it was as well for them to invoke her support as well as that of her sons. And what they were asking for the whole time, the request that they wanted to make to Mutesa, the permission that they wanted to obtain, was to have the right to go on uh, eastwards to the actual point which the Baganda called the stones, the actual point where the Nile flowed out of Lake Victoria. And we can say a little more about that as we move on to the next slide. And this shows the result of the expedition uh, as Grant saw it at the time and the reality. When Mortesa finally gave permission for the two men to leave his court and uh, go towards the source of the Nile and provided an escort to take them, they believed that it was very important to get underway as soon as they possibly could. There was a great hurry because they erroneously believed that Petherick, whom we mentioned before, the man who was <coughs> the mining engineer who was sailing up the Nile, had already sailed north to meet them and would be waiting for them. Of course, Petherick, in point of fact, was nowhere near. It, uh, by June 1862, Petherick had not even reached Gondokoro, which uh, is to the north there on the uh, on the, on the Nile. Nevertheless, uh, uh, they, they were in a great hurry, and so Grant, for some reasons that are perhaps still a little obscure, said to speak, well, yeah, we are in a hurry, I can still not walk very fast because of my ulcerated leg, you'd better go. Uh, we have no doubt that the source of the Nile is is there, you, you go. Um, is that what happened? Or did Speak himself hint uh, that that would be the better way of doing it, that so he alone would have the honour on the 28th of June 1862 of actually reaching the source of the Nile which everyone had been looking for since for 2,000 years or more. You'll notice if you look at both these maps two things. One, that uh, he actually called the area of the source, the Ripon Falls. The second thing to notice, if you can, at the very bottom left-hand side of the coloured map on the left, uh, J. A. Grant Fekit. It was Grant who drew the map showing the results of the expedition. Uh, later on, a bit later on, the Times Literary Supplement published a sort of simpler, or slightly simplified, version of that map, which you see in, in the middle, which in some ways is perhaps rather uh, rather clearer. And you notice at the very top of the map, the northernmost edge of the map, you see Gondokoro. Gondokoro, which is near present-day Juba, is really the effective limit of navigation on the Nile, or certainly was at, at the time. And uh, 
on the extreme right I've included the little map of uh, the lake region as it really was, uh, or really is indeed, and uh, the uh, uh, real course of the rivers and the position of the lakes can be seen. But the, the, the Grant version is not too far from the, the truth. Uh, I could say much more about the, that uh, map, or all the maps, and I think the thing I would like you to note is that I think that one should uh, examine the Nile and its course in the light of its geomorphological history uh, and geological history, uh, rather than simply in terms of uh, where its outlets are or whether Ptolemy had got the right information about it. And there is a section of my book uh, which has drawn attention to, which will tell you more on that. Well, eventually, uh, despite all the troubles over the Nile itself, the um, rulers did succeed in moving on to Bunyoro, another kingdom to the north of Buganda, another one of the so-called interlocustrian kingdoms. And its ruler was a man called Kamarazi. And he was a ruler who proved, proved to be very suspicious and very difficult to deal with. But not surprising. Uh, he had inherited a kingdom which was really only a remnant of the once mighty kingdom of Bunyoro Kitar, which had dominated practically the whole of the Lake region. Um, but he had been cut down by rivals, especially the Baganda. He uh, had uh, people in his family trying to turf him off his throne. And above all, I think, by the middle of the 19th century, he was being constantly harried and troubled by rapacious slave and ivory traders from Egypt and especially from Khartoum. And so we have two uh, pictures here uh, by Grant. First of all, some of those rapacious traders um, carrying tusks. I think Grant later found that he'd drawn the tusks rather too big. Most would not have been quite as big as that in relation to human beings, but it does make make the point. The other um, picture, the one on the left, is of interest because uh, despite uh, the difficulties, Speak and Grant hoped to introduce Camarazzi to the idea of Christianity and the benefits of modern civilization. And uh, here you see him as depicted by Grant, and he was even persuaded to add his autograph, <laughs> a, a scribble, to the uh, picture here, which, which you will see. Finally, after a good deal of trouble, the two explorers did succeed in reaching Gondokoro, uh, as, which, as I said earlier, is near the present day uh, tuba. You can just see the river uh, in the background there. Uh, so on the left towards the middle and uh, on the right are examples of the, the others or the boats which the um, Nile traders were using to come northwards. And on the extreme left you see a mission house uh, which had had been a Roman Catholic mission for a time, but which had been uh, abandoned. But it was here that um, Grant and Speak really ceased to be explorers. They expected to find Petherick there, he wasn't there. Uh, but the person who was there was a man called Samuel Baker. He was an elephant hunter uh, in Ceylon, and there is now 
exploring Africa and he was a bit disappointed at first to learn that Grant and Speak had identified the source of the Nile but they said if you go on northwards you'll find this other lake which we didn't have time to explore ourselves and surely that will be enough for you. Well in fact Baker did go later on after he'd given them various kinds of aid uh, uh, Baker did go on southwards to explore Lake Albert. Uh, it was inevitable I suppose that he should call the Lake Albert when it was next door to Lake Victoria. So, but it, uh, Baker much exaggerated the size and importance of Lake Albert, much exaggerated the uh, extent of it, much exaggerated the extent of what he had achieved. He claimed to have ended the slave trade and so on. Uh, I mean, he t really told a lot of untruths, uh, in, in my opinion. I, d I don't think in the end he was a very worthy, worthy person. But uh, uh, but there it was. He achieved fame because he had a beautiful woman with him as his mistress. Later became his wife, and uh, they were a, a romantic and famous couple at home. And uh, he was given a knighthood, but they didn't give a knighthood to either grant or to speak, which was perhaps a bit hard. So what happened in the end uh, to grant and speak? Well, uh, my final slide uh, completes my story. Here you see two memorials that were made to grant. The first of them is this large granite cross shown in the cemetery at Nam, and it looks south to a rather nice house that uh, Grant had, had built for himself and his wife in uh, well, just outside Nam to the south. Uh, it commemorates to uh, eventually his wife uh, and one of his sons who was killed in the Boer War, the, the, well, the second South African War, more, more correctly. But I think you might say that it also, as well as looking south to his house, it's looking further towards Africa. And I think Grant's name is a name that should be remembered uh, with respect and admiration in relation to Africa. Uh, because he understood, he came to understand many of the people so well, he came to understand the real character of the continent so much better than many other travellers, and he provided so much information about it. The other memorial, which is probably illegal for me to show you, is the one that uh, can be found in the crypt of St Paul's Cathedral in London. So there was some considerable respect for Grant when, when, when he died. And you see his picture there, or his, the portrait is, is given, and uh, what are supposed to be various scenes from his life. And it mentions various encounters that he had experienced in India. But it ends up, as you can see more clearly, uh, by mentioning the Nile in capital letters. And I think Although uh, Grant did not see the actual source of the Nile, as we discovered, uh, he had sailed on the Nile, uh, he had written about the Nile, he had mapped the Nile. And so I think he is the prime character uh, among the explorers who actually solved the 2,000-year-old problem of the Nile. But, as I've just said, he did much more besides. I think he was a great man and should be recognised as one of the major explorers of Africa. I hope this has been of some use. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.